Spectrum News One presents LA Times The Envelope Roundtables, brought to you by Apple TV Plus's The Morning Show. For your Emmy consideration in all drama series categories. This is the Los Angeles Times series, The Envelope. Our discussions with the most creative minds in entertainment. Kate Blanchett is executive producer and star of FX's Mrs. America, which goes inside the heated battle for the soul of the women's movement in the 1970s. Cynthia Rivo stars in HBO's The Outsider, portraying a uniquely skilled private detective in the crime thriller based on the Stephen King novel. Hugh Jackman stars in HBO's Bad Education, the ripped from the headlines tale of a school superintendent who gets caught in the largest public school embezzlement in U.S. history. Nicole Kidman stars and executive produces HBO's Big Little Lies, a story that tackles the lives of small town women embroiled in a murder case. Regina King stars in HBO's Watchmen, a series based on a DC comic that sheds new light on racist violence in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Sandra O oh serves as the star and executive producer of BBC America's Killing Eve, a spy thriller in which O oh plays an investigator on the trail of a deadly assassin. Jeremy Strong stars as the not-so-prodigal son in HBO's Succession, an extremely dark comedy that explores the power, greed, and portrayal of a family wrestling for control of a media empire. Kerry Washington is an executive producer and co-lead in HBO's Little Fires Everywhere, a suburban drama that examines issues of race, class, and parenting. Hi, everyone. I'm LZ Granderson, coach of columns for the Los Angeles Times. Every year, just before the Television Academy begins casting its votes for the Emmy Awards, the LA Times gather the stars of TV for a series of discussions about their work. But this year, it's not like any we've ever had before. The discussion you're about to see happened over Zoom in mid-May. The coronavirus-related lockdown was entering its third month, but the mass protests that followed the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd hadn't happened yet. While self-isolating at home, our guests reflected on their shows and their apprehension about what working on set will look like once Hollywood goes back to work. From the LA Times, Here's the Envelope Emmy Roundtable, Drama. Hello, I'm LZ Granderson, culture columnist for the Los Angeles Times. And today I'm so excited to introduce our guest for some of television's top dramatic programming. Welcome to the Envelope Drama Roundtable. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Cool. Thanks for you. having us. I'm going to get right to it. I'm so excited to do this because so many of your shows deal with the themes of belonging and trying to find your place in this world. You know, you have Kate's character who's trying to find a well-defined place for women to belong in society. Jeremy, your character is trying to figure out how to fit in in his father's company. Cynthia, you're from The Outsider. You are literally an outsider. So to begin this conversation, I want to start with Carrie. And I just want to know what's really driving your character in Little Fires Everywhere. Is it trying to fit in or is it trying to find peace with the fact that you don't? I don't think either. I think what's driving Mia is, um, is the determination to carve a path for herself because I think she has decided that she doesn't belong in any traditional sense. And so her fierce commitment to live this kind of unapologetic life outside of the boundaries of normal culture is, is because she's created a world where she belongs just to her daughter, where they belong to each other. Bright is your real last name. Warren was my brother's name. I had a fantastic brother, but he died. And then my parents disowned me and you were my everything. What about you, Cynthia? I think the, the thing that's probably driving Holly is is the the search for the truth, no matter what that might be. She just is an outsider it, it, because of the way she processes things, the way she speaks to people, the way she uh, can communicate with others. She she finds it quite difficult 
in the traditional sense to communicate with people. And I think her journey is about finding ways to find connections. I can tell you what day May 1st lands on 204 years from now, faster than any computer on Earth. I can look at a skyscraper for two seconds from a speeding car and tell you within six inches how tall that building is. And I can not only recite the lyrics of every rock and roll song written from 1954 to the present day, but I can tell you which billboard chart position they were in week to week before they fell off completely. But you know what? I don't listen to music because I don't like it. She's new to me in that way because I've never had to figure out a person like that before. And I think working with, on her was really interesting because I tried to find a way in which, because I do believe that she's on the spectrum and I wanted to make sure that that did not mean that she didn't have the humanity that I believe everybody has. So trying to put that forward as well as the way in which she communicates was is probably the driving force. It's about finding her humanity and and her connection to people, really. Jeremy, you seem to, your character really seemed to struggle just trying to find his place both within the company, but also just in life itself. I think sort of the, the engine behind this character is, is in the disparity between who he is and who he wants to be. I've always loved the, the sort of modern anti-hero, and I, I think of Kendall Roy as a sort of uh, non-hero, unhero, someone who's been anointed with this power and by birth and station is required to uh, act heroically, but he's not equipped to do so and he's unable to do so. So he's, he's, he's given this burden that he can't carry. So it's, it's kind of a heavy as the head that wears the crown, uh, damaged, damaged as the head that wears the crown uh, condition. Um, and he's sort of caught in this endless struggle the outer and inner struggle, which is something I, you know, can, can identify with and care about. My father is a malignant presence, a bully and a liar, and he was fully personally aware of these events for many years and made efforts to hide and cover up. He had a twisted sense of loyalty to bad actors like Lester McClintock. Me. Disregard for the safety of migrant workers non-union and union workers, and for vulnerable performers and guests. My father keeps a watchful eye over every inch of his whole empire. Aspirationally, you know, as an actor, uh, falling short of a mark is, is, I think, something that one feels, or I certainly feel. I was doing a Connor McPherson play years and years ago in a storefront on 39th Street. And Connor McPherson wrote in the liner notes that his characters have been summoned by God to the stage to tell the truth. And I thought that was such a beautiful ideal to sort of strive for. And one to that- To fail by. <laughs> and fail by, yeah. Wow, yeah. it's like, how do you live up to that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kate, your character is really interesting because you know, in hindsight, a lot of people can look at her as sort of the villain, if you will. But at that particular time, she truly was representing a different perspective and wasn't necessarily a gender traitor, if you will. How did you find balance within that with knowing modern eyes were going to be looking on a character that was from decades prior? Uh, yes. I mean, I look, I didn't know anything about my character. I knew, I thought I knew a lot. Like, at Nicole, I've heard you talk a lot about your mother and being growing up with a second wave feminist mother. And, you know, I identified as a feminist. I thought it was about equality. And and so I thought I, I didn't know it was a polarizing issue in, in the States. And I also thought that, that the Equal Rights Amendment was ratified. So it was a huge journey for me to discover that, in fact, there was an equal and opposite movement in, in second wave feminism that was the traditional women who felt marginalized by the social revolution, and that, that in fact the notion of equality in the 1970s was more a bipartisan than it is now, you know, and so that, in, that across party lines there were a whole lot of Republican feminists um, and that it was Phyllis Schlafly who I played who actually changed the language around feminism that, that my generation inherited and that all of that kind of pejorative language around being a feminist and and what our ambitions were and the fact that if you were identified as a feminist, you were a man-hater or anti-family, that actually came out of, of the rhetoric of 
Phyllis Schlafly, who was was really protecting what she saw as a communist threat. And then in fact, she was the outsider. She was the underdog. And the notion of equality and and what the feminists were pushing for in the 1970s was in fact much more mainstream than I think it is today. Under our current system, uh, in a case of a breakup of marriage, the mother gets the children. Now, uh, who wants to trade that in for a so-called uh, equality whereby each uh, parent gets one child. The ERA does not say that in the case of divorce, each parent gets one child. Oh, yes, it does. It says you have to interpret things absolutely equally. Well, what if she has one child? Would it be cut in half? Oh, <laughs> oh well, you, you can joke all you want. I mean, the courts uh, would decide, as they did uh, with a recent uh, Washington, D.C. case, where three children were given to the father and the mother had to pay child support. What I mean, was the crazy name of the case? That was an advance for women. But the, the larger issue is that the ERA erodes the institution of marriage, not Cite just in the divorce. Case. The case? So it was, it was quite challenging to play someone who was, and you, but Hugh, you must have found this too with your character, someone who you can see is so, what, what their, their dubious achievements are, are, are so maligned, you then have to reverse engineer and work out what drives them. And so yeah. I found it really challenging to play someone who, if you look at what they have achieved, you, you would think that is so far away from my set of values. And to try and find the points of similarity, you know, the, what was their childhood like? You know, wh what are they deeply frightened of in order to, in, to behave in such a polarising way? I found it really challenging, actually. By the way, Kate, thanks, thanks for mentioning that. And, and I emailed you last night just to say how blown away Deb and I have been by the series and all the different perspectives, female perspectives you get. I think there's a weight of responsibility added to it, which I actually find challenging. So I find that you have to have a really good reason to want to make the movie, to want to play the character, and obviously we did. That's you stole you? from the schools, Pam, from... from the taxpayers from the, from the kids we're supposed to serve. I mean, this kind of behavior goes beyond the bounds of immoral. It, 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 it's cruel. It's it's heinous. It's it's sociopathic even. Uh, sociopathic? What? The shameless self-interest. The 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 unstable personality. The the parade of rotten marriages. It... Frank. But I think in the same way, playing Frank Dasson. Our job is to show every side of it, to show, yes, the background, why this happens, because all of us are fallible. All of us are susceptible mm -hmm. to doing things we're not proud of. All of us, if we look back on our life, are probably held positions that we completely disagree with now. How is it possible that someone like Frank could go so far off from being a very respected, clearly motivated, uh, out of service to others, sort of human being, to being in prison for four and a half years. I find the cautionary tale of that is fascinating, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I do think that circumstance really derails us and that it's so, we, you know, and that this whole kind of social media universe that we've, whether we participate in or not, but we found ourselves in, is it's a place of judgment, very quick judgment and that we even though recent history is um can seem so far away it informs you know where we are now and so it's it's so important to understand it with an open mind mm. you know, because I, I don't think any we're all heroes of our own universe <laughs> right it'll have to be probably i love lucy because that was where television began. It's where reality television began. And she's one of the most extraordinary um, televisual performers ever. If I could have been in the cast of any show ever, this is gonna sound very silly, but it probably would have been Buffy the Vampire Slayer because I was obsessed when I was younger. Um, and I, I don't know if I would, I, a vampire slayer of sorts, I probably would have been, but I don't know that it would have been Buffy. Or maybe if I had to play one of the characters, it would have been Willow. If I could have been cast in any TV show, I think the number one show for me would have to be Faulty Towers, a British comedy series that starred John Cleese. I, I think they only made maybe 10 episodes, maybe eight episodes of it. 
I would have seen each of those episodes 50 times. And John Cleese's character, Basil Fawlty, uh, that would be my number one character to play. Oh, Regina, you know, in keeping up with this theme of taking a moment in history and breathing life for the modern times, you know, Watchmen is very, very interesting in a sense that you're kind of in an alternative universe, but you use a very modern day universe conversation in terms of race relations and what happened in the past and how that influences what's happening today. Can you talk a little bit about your character and was that the, the part of this story that attracted to you, you to that character the most? What was really um, attractive to me about the character is this, um, which I think is something that so many humans experience and don't realize they're experiencing is this trauma that she's inherited. And she doesn't even realize that she has inherited that so much of her life right now in this moment is informed by that trauma that she's inherited. I know why you didn't call me. Why? You were mad that my sitter bailed and you had to suffer through Black Oklahoma without having someone to roll your eyes at. Sitter bailed? Yes. Well, you and Cal missed out because Black Oklahoma was delightful. You were not allowed to call it that. And she's kind of created this world where being an outsider is actually a safe space to be. She finds comfort in that. She finds comfort in uh, just having created this little safe um, space with her family and then having an identity outside of that with that 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 small nucleus that's her family and just navigating that and then it all exploding all in a matter of a few hours you know when she loses someone that she thinks is very dear to her and you know depending on the person that's watching you know i, I think that he, he he still does hold a dear place in her heart but when you are struggling with discovering uh, someone being not who you thought they are and you still can't change those emotions that you have inside, that becomes, as far as that actor playing that, it, it just, for lack of a better word, it's fun <laughs> because it is a challenge. It, there, you, you are digging into all of these little places to find the nuances to, um, make this alternative universe, this alternative character uh, ring true to um, the real world. If that makes any sense at all. It does in my head. <laughs> it does in your performance too, so. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Beautiful. One of the things that I really love in watching your performance, Regina, as well as Carrie's and Sandra's is the fact that you're, you're representing minorities in a way that hadn't really been able to be represented before. And what I mean by that is I'm used to seeing women of color be demonstrative. And you perform these characters with such great nuance. And I'm just curious, uh, I'll start with Sandra. Um, the nuance of Eve, the complications of her, um, how refreshing is it to be able to just give a look without having to say much and be able to express so much and not have people say, can you give me more? And I think what you're speaking about is, is, is that you're seeing uh, representation moving into the, the central field. And the nuance is just the complicated texture of, of a full fleshed character. And when you're saying the, the demonstrative, I, 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 I interpret it that as uh, sometimes it can be stereotypical. And I will say, even though Regina's piece is, is actually very uh, clearly about race, uh, many of the characters I have played, which I am very interested in moving through and beyond, have not been about my character's race necessarily. And I know myself, as my uh, authorship of my own work has grown, I've always been trying to infuse more 
pieces of my character's ethnicity and cultural background. <laughs> what the hell are you doing here? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You texted me. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. It didn't make a lot of sense. Something about loo, paper, beer. Oh, oh God. I was a bit worried, if I'm honest, so I tracked your phone. You know, you really shouldn't leave your front door open considering the amount of people that have tried to kill you. Oh. Oh. At the very top of uh, season three in uh, Killing Eve, you see Eve in, um, in New Malden, which is actually the largest uh, gathering of uh, um, uh, Koreans outside of Korea in Europe. And is in New Malden. <laughs> it's in New Malden. Anyway, but... I, I, I wanted it to be set there and I wanted it to be set in a place where, where Eve could try and disappear for, for a while. It was, it was just a, a small bit of the show, but I felt that I wanted to bring, I wanted to try and bring the, the flavor of, of that because everyone had, like, especially for someone like me, I, I, mm, we carry our culture, we carry our history. And typically, uh, you know, white Hollywood does not write it, does not write our culture. Carrie? Um, I think it's a really exciting extension of the conversation you were having with Hugh and, um, and Kate earlier, this idea that, that we have a tendency in our representation of humanity to be really reductive and to want to put people in these kind of limited boxes of identity and I think one thing that was exciting for us on Little Fires was that the character of Mia in the novel, the beautiful novel by Celeste Singh, she was written ambiguously with regard to race. And so our choice to make Mia black in some ways represented a, a kind of progress that we talk about a lot in the business and sort of you know, colorblind approach to casting of like anybody that that character could be any race. So let's let's think about other races that that character could possibly be, which I think is what progress looked like maybe in this business decades ago. The second layer of what makes that matter is then what Sandra was talking about is being in the writer's room and saying, okay, if we're going to make her black, how does that require the story to shift? What are the elements that we can pull out and grow? Um, what's unique about her experience that may deepen what's in the novel or evolve forward something that's in the novel? So I think it's, it's really moving to me to hear everybody talk because I think many of us do play characters that, that the rest of the world would want to stereotype, whether it's on Succession or Phyllis Schlafly or somebody like Mia or, but, or, or somebody on the spectrum, like, you know, the beautiful work that you're doing, Cynthia, all of us play these characters that society could perceive of, perceive of as other and decide to limit in the way that we deal with each other's death as human beings and complexity. So that's our job, right? Like that is our job as storytellers is to make people take pause and realize that human beings, no matter who we are, we're, co we're complicated and rich and deep. And whether we look like you or don't look like you, there are, there are elements to our story that are unique and precious. And that's what life looks like, no matter who you are or where you're born. That, like, that, that's literally our job. I chose you and everything is on the line for me. We have an opportunity to do something truly meaningful. We're the morning show. We can do anything. It's my whole life. You can't ask me to not fight for that. We're in the middle of an epic rebirth. From the outside looking in, Social economics tend to put up roadblocks in terms of us being able to identify with one another. And I'm curious, Nicole, your character, Celeste, on the outside looking in, she seems to be fine, but she's got a lot of internal things going on that means she is struggling. Uh, how is it playing a character who, in a lot of ways, represents a lot of people who have a certain socioeconomic status? Um, I think for, for us in, this, in making a second season of Big Little Lies was trying to um, deal with the aftermath and 
go, what is the truth? Because I think a lot of people wanted the female characters to come out um, healed and strong and capable and all of these things. That would have been satisfying. Um, And the truth is, particularly with somebody like Celeste, that's not the case. It's not like suddenly he's gone. It's now I have to actually deal with um, all of those emotions that come with the loss, that come with the idea of now I'm a single mother taking care of two little boys that are going to have a really rough road ahead. And what is the what does it mean to still not be healed? Because it's not about, it's about, I still want him. I still, I can look at him from now from a distance and remember only the good times, which, and that addiction to a, um, to a person and the way in which that plays out is really fascinating to me. This is a serious situation and the boy needed stitches. So I need to know who instigated the fight. Was it you, Max? Was it? The same stuff about Dad. And he was picking on Ziggy. So what? So the three of you attacked him? You ganged up on him? You can't do that. Violence is not the answer. Look at me. You think it is? So, so much of it for us was trying to be truthful and authentic with what was to come, but still have it amidst an entertaining sort of genre, but also wanting to just say something about being able to explore all these different cultures and ideas as a producer now, being in the position to go, to stand up and go, let's get these shows made that are not necessarily based in America but about we have a show right now that we're looking to do in Hong Kong that has a lead Korean female has a lead Chinese female has a lead American and a lead British and that future is so exciting but my gosh with what's happened to the world right now it's going to get harder and harder and that's terrifying so um being able to all of us constantly say how needed it is and how those um but we've you know and trying to find the directors that can also tell those stories with truth and uh, we were looking for the perfect director for that and we found Lulu Wong and so to have access to her is fantastic um but we need people like Sandra you know going this is how you have to adjust the writing and this is how you have to um change it and help uh, help the, but I'm just scared right now because I'm like, how do we make these shows? Which I'm sorry to bring up because I know that's a bummer, but it's, <laughs> I'd love to know what everyone else is planning and doing. It's like there is uh, equal force. Like as soon as things also start opening up, we're going to start making this stuff. There is this mm-hmm. other force that comes in called a pandemic that seems mm-hmm. to, seems to be a... Uh, stopping uh, the flow of, of making things in a different way. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in the, our challenge of getting back into production, basically how, how we uh, increase uh, an interior type of uh, confidence and resilience and um, uh, clarity in what is essential to make. It is up to, I think, us who have some ability and knowledge to be able to impart, to try and find these different avenues. And I think it takes the time, actually this time, for the clarity and um, a vision to hopefully uh, be burst and, you know, to come forward. It's frightening because there's so many opportunities. We've we've all been working so hard to create now these paths mm-hmm. and just trying to keep them still open and, and forging ahead is like, okay. But I suppose these, that's why I'm like, I was so excited to just have conversation because I haven't had a lot of conversations about what the future holds and how do we keep doing this because we're in positions of power right now. Um, and wanting to use that responsibly and wanting to use that um, that creative power to go, how do we keep supporting and um, moving this forward when there is these massive hurdles again? We have been all fighting to kind of open up. Yeah. Uh, don't want them to retract. There is something really wonderful as a performer who who's in music and and acting. I'm watching musicians literally 
take the gear and shift in a different way. So people are finding really wonderful creative ways to still make music, to still uh, make uh, ways to connect with others in that way. And so I think it's not necessarily how, I guess it's not necessarily where we're going to make it or when. It's sort of how do we sh- how do we shift and create something that just feels and may look different to what we're used to. Um, and that way we we get to open the doors to who we're talking to and who we create with. Um, the fact that we're all on this right now means that we get to have a conversation with each other, which may not necessarily have happened before. Um, where yeah. We might be in our rooms, but we're in the same room together now, right? Well, first of all, Cynthia, I want to hear the music immediately. So <laughs> if you wouldn't mind just singing one of those songs now, it'd be great. But <laughs> And... Our job as storytellers, uh, being part of a story, is to unite, to add meaning, to to melt the hearts of an audience. And we are currently in a situation I've never experienced in my life where the whole world is sort of experiencing something unifying. Uh, of course, the experience is very different for different people, and, and you know that's that's something we need to really talk about. But somehow, the whole world is this is dominating our thinking and our feeling and our problem solving. And I think as, I think what you're saying, Nicole, there's obviously going to be restrictions in filmmaking. It's obviously going to have to start smaller. We're going to have those, you know, restrictions. But in terms of storytelling and opportunities, who knows? Because we need to make sense of what's happening as a planet, as a human race. And I think that's part of our job. I find that exciting. For those of you who have ongoing series, do you imagine seeing some of these storylines in terms of what the world, what the globe is dealing with right now, finding its way into your stories, or do you think you're gonna try and keep them separate? That's a great question. (laughs) We're in the midst of uh, digging in. I mean, that's right now something that I know, um, you know, different people I've talked to with their ongoing shows are going, do we write this in or do we not? I suppose that's like, what are you gonna do, Jeremy? We're all uh, hanging for that third season. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Please. <We're> addicted. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so interesting because Nicole and, and, and Hugh, we, the, what we've all been working on in a way, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of decadence, there's a kind of end times decadence in the material and, and a kind of uh, moral rot and erosion uh, happening. And, and, and now we're experiencing this reckoning in the world. I, th- I think our show, um, I don't know what Jesse Armstrong is, is planning to do. I know that I have lobbied hard to, to set it very squarely in, in this moment that we're in. And, you know, yeah, I guess not, not, that, not, that, not that we have this coming, but I guess in a sense, and, and Nicole, you sort of were totally immersed in this world, but part of our show touching on the sort of Fox News parallel and this, this thing that was a vector for just pumping, you know, toxic pathogenic stuff into the groundwater. And that groundwater is what, what it, we're now left with. Not that that had anything directly to do with, with this pandemic, but it, but it sort of feels somehow uh, connected, and, and and I would think that the sto- that the writers have to write now from from this place that we're in. It, it surely it's the stuff of great and real drama. How do you weave a tragedy like this into uh, a narrative without looking as if you're exploiting it? You know, I remember the early days in which we saw films that were tied to 9/11. There was a lot of pushback because people thought it was too soon. If your question is about like when will we start to film scenes where people have masks on at the supermarket, I don't know, but I think the the deep emotional work of what the pandemic is doing to and on and for all of us is is starts now. Like that starts to be reflected in the material now because we don't have a choice. Like we're we're going to be bringing our vision and our hearts to the work that we're doing, whether it's in the writer's room or the edit room. So it's already there. It's going to be there. This, this, this need to kind of deal with our hearts breaking down or breaking open or breaking in whatever ways they're breaking, like 
it, that that's going to start living in the work yesterday for sure. I think it's a great question. We need to be bold. I, I was just last week watching a movie that I've never seen before, a 1942 movie, To Be or Not To Be. I'm not sure if any of you guys have seen it. It's Carol Lombard and Jack Benny. It's a classic. And it was made in 1941, actually, and it's a satire about the invasion, Hitler's invasion of Poland, set in Poland. And when it came out in 1942, it got pretty much eviscerated for in that exact question you asked. This is too soon. This is not funny. Um, how could you make this movie? And, of course, history now sees that movie as being so bold and really highlighting because he had problems with censors in Poland and all over that. He was using whatever means he could to highlight the world to what was happening, and it happened to be comedy. And it would have been difficult, I'm sure, to watch. Uh, it, would have, it was a bold, bold choice. And history has seen that as a really great bet, like it was a great choice. And I think ultimately if your goal is to illuminate, to educate, to melt people's heart, if that's your goal, that will come through. If you want to exploit, if you want just eyeballs or if you just want to use people's fear or conspiracy theories, for example, to just get ratings, that will come through as well in history. So I think it's not a time to be, it is a time to be bold. I think we should be making those stories, but it's gotta be for the right reason. I feel like my lost opportunity in life was to do like a version of Reading Rainbow, <laughs> where I got to be LeVar Burton reading all those amazing stories, so. I would absolutely have been in the show Fame, and I would have played Coco, played by the wonderful Erica Gimple. Well, I just would have liked to have been in Seinfeld, but <laughs> that would never have happened. So I would have played anyone, <laughs> Kramer. Um... <laughs> You know, Hugh, as an uh, openly gay person myself, I looked at Frank Tassoni and I wasn't quite sure if I hated him or if I sympathized with him. Um, why do you think he committed the crimes that he did? Because it gave the gays a really bad look. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, I heard in my research an interview with him and, and he said when he first went for an interview uh, for a superintendent job in Long Island, he said that he was gay and the guy gave him the interview and said, I don't, I don't think you should tell me that. And so he sort of retracted it within the interview and so he got that message back and whenever that was, I guess, late 80s, 90s, that there are still some places where that's not okay. So, does your wife come with you on these things or? Oh, uh, was she back in New York? Or? No, no, my wife passed away. Oh. Sorry. I don't know. It's, it's fine. It was a long time ago. Um, it was before I had you, even. And we forget now in 2020 where it seems so fine. But I think even in the beginning of 2000s, there were some places, you know, stuffy law firms where you just weren't going to become partners. So you, it wasn't, I don't think he was completely closeted, but he certainly kept it hidden from work. And, and I, I feel for him. I think that would have been a really, really tough decision because he, Started off wanting to make a difference, wanted to get into public education. He, you know, got his doctorate from Columbia and he came, became one of the most successful superintendents in the country with the highest contract, I think, in the United States and took that school to number four. It was on its way to being number one. Uh, I think he was a perfectionist and what started as a little small thing, like a little lunch, $30 lunch that he went to the business office and said, oh, listen, let me give you right a check for that. And the business office said, oh, listen, don't worry about it. You, you work 14 hours a day, let it go. Just that little chink became quicksand. And before he knew it, he was drowning. I mean, he, they were on the front page of every newspaper for a year. There's no point doing the movie just to, you know, tar and feather someone and drag them through the streets and throw stones at them again. It's only, only point in doing it is to think, okay, what? What in my life have I kind of been a little edgy about, a little unethical about? Don't you also feel like every um, every great character needs some secrets? 
like you don't you don't even know who your yeah. character is so you know what what your secrets are in some ways sometimes 100 percent. i like when i've already you know when you're doing a series i've already started and then the then you discover your character's secret or one of your character's secret yeah. along the way and you had an idea of where you were going in your mind and the writer threw that loop at you and you're like hmm how am i going to navigate this how am i going to yeah. weave this in and that's yeah. always uh kind of exciting and, and challenging at the same time but uh when you get on the other side of it together you know because i look at us all the storytellers not just the creators the actors the cameramen everyone is part of the storytelling process and when you've discovered that secret and you didn't go know going into it and you get on the other side of it um and see the finished product and the arc that that secret led you on is uh yes. satisfying you know what it would be amazing i don't think that we have time i would love to know and carrie i gotta tell you i'm gonna ask you this eventually um <laughs> like what is everyone's acting secret <laughs> but I mean, we all have something I'm, i mean i'm not necessarily going to spill my beans here yeah but when we're talking about secret right you know like carrie is talking about there, she has a secret underlying kind of uh, emotional rhythm um that is all her own she's on set she's doing her own thing it's all it's all here but it's it's all here but it's translating out you know and um I mean, in probably in only the most personal of uh, situations, which this is not necessarily, I would, there are some people, everyone here, I would like to know what is keeping, what is that underlying heartbeat that is, is underneath each of those characters that you, that is coming from your own, I don't, not, not that everyone works the same way, but is coming from your own material. That is constantly fast but it it reminds me though of a, an interview i saw with michelle pfeiffer a couple years ago where she was saying like i don't like to talk about my process because also i don't know that i always understand my process because there's mm -hmm. something about it that's magic like every character is different every character requires you know you we have we each have our different toolboxes and our approaches and but at the end of the day, it's like, what is going to be the alchemy that's going to unlock each story that, you know, each character, each narrative requires its own rich ritual and, and like willingness to climb a new mountain. Um, so it's just, it's also like ever evolving. And each director demands something different, which I find yeah. the great yeah. sort of journey is that, okay, where do we go and who am I now? um going to be in a partnership with um because the director is so much a part of if you have a great one so much a part of the construction of it and them understanding how you how you work is part of the mm. part of the magic because if you're not understood in that way then you got to really go it alone which I find much tougher I much prefer to get get someone that goes oh okay I know how to work with you that's glorious. That a great director can help you tap into places that you didn't even know existed in the moment. Yep. Mm -hmm. I just want to say Regina King did that for me at Scandal because she's an exceptional director. I was like, oh, <laughs> yes, oh, please do it. Oh, we're about to offer you something, Regina. <laughs> <laughs> I well, love you, ladies. <laughs> Last question for you before we go, talking about that. <laughs> What has it been like over the years watching so many more women be behind the lens and not just in front of it? And let's start with um, let's start with Cynthia. Um, well, you know what I what it what it's been for me particularly is inspirational. Um, both Regina and Kerry will know because I reach I've reached out to them for my little <laughs> for the, so you know if we if we do end up going into a second series, one of the things I really required was that there were more women behind the camera and that there were more women that looked like me because there's this, um, for me, there is a, a lonely thing in that on this particular series, the woman who is of color is me and it follows through to the end. And what I wanted was to be able to share that 
with people who would understand what it is to be a woman of color, what it is to be a black woman and women who understood what it takes to create the detail that this kind of woman needs. Um, because it's, it's tough when no one else understands that language and to know that there is the opportunity to do that, to even ask for it, um, means that there's a bit of oxygen. There's a bit of air. I can, breathe easier. Um, it's a wonderful thing to be able to see women behind the camera, the rigor. On, on Harriet, we had women, as far as the eye could see, it was my director, it was my producer. I don't know if you know how extraordinary this is, but you have made it 100 miles to freedom all by yourself. Would you like to pick a new name to mark your freedom? Harriet Tubman. And you're being able to share um, there's a kismet that you have when you can share something with other women um, that creates what you see on screen. And I think that that is only going to feed into the creation that we can get to make really and truly. Yeah, it's wonderful. And, and by the way, can I just say on behalf of Jeremy, thank you very much, uh, ladies, for having us here as part of this. this is <laughs> Hugh, when, I got the, when we got these calls to do it, and and LZ can attest to this. I said, um, we need more men in the <laughs> Isn't it nice to get to the point where you say, we need more men? And it's funny, in my career, the very first job I did was with a woman and uh, I just finished doing a film with Lisa Joy. It was so amazing uh, to work with her. I cannot wait. I know Nicole, and I know so many of you have been really pushing that and, and I find it incredibly inspiring. And you know, just little things. There was a, I, didn't, I haven't done a lot of them in my career, but there was a sex scene in the movie. And doing that with a female director is completely different. Like, particularly with Lisa. That whole thing was completely different. Uh, and, and I don't want to get away. Different the, how? Different how, so, uh, Hugh. By the way, Lisa, I love Lisa Joy. I think she is just amazing. She's a genius. So yes, Lisa really said, is. I went through, I watched every single sex scene that has ever been done in Hollywood literally everyone in a hundred years. And she said, I could not see one where I could actually imagine the woman having an orgasm. Right. She said, she said every position, every, the thing I was like, no, it's not working. So she said, that's my goal. So I don't want to spoil the scene, but there you go. Nice. <laughs> All right. Lisa. That's, that's a great way to end this, uh, this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk to you guys all day. Thank you so much for your time, your insight, your generosity is very much appreciated. This was the Envelope Drama Roundtable. I'm so glad you guys were with us. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your work. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. You're amazing. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Every one of you. <laughs> Do we now? How do we get out of here? <laughs> Leave. How? <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye. I don't have to Bye. leave. You can stick around Bye. if you want to. <laughs> Bye.